you not know? Have you not heard? My father does not get weary, no. He brings passion to a willing heart, even when you get tired and faint. Strength will come to those that wait. If you wait on the Lord, He will renew your strength. Try to not get weary. If you wait on the Lord, He will renew your strength. Run and not get weary, walk and not faint. They that wait on the Lord will renew their strength. Run and not get weary, walk and not faint. They that wait on the Lord will renew their strength. Run and not get weary, walk and not faint. Do you not know, have you not heard? My Father does not get weary, no. He brings passion to a willing heart. Even when Tired and faint, strength will come to those that wait. If you wait on the Lord, will renew your strength. Run and not get weary, walk and not faint. If you wait on the Lord, He will renew your strength. Run and not get weary, walk and not Glory to your holy name. So close, I believe you're holding me now in your hand. I belong, you'll never let me go. So close, I believe you're holding me now in your hand. I belong, you'll never let me go. You gave your life in your endless love. You set me free and showed the Never let me go so close I believe you're holding me now in your hand I belong you'll never let me go all along you were beside me and I couldn't tell Through the years You showed me more of you More of you So close I believe You're holding me now In your hands 
I belong You'll never let me go So close I believe You're holding me now In your hand I belong You'll never let me go Never let me go Never let me go You'll never let me go Psalm 92 came up to me, and uh, particularly the Passions Translation version of it in the first first five uh, first five verses. So I thought I would read that right now. It's so enjoyable to come before you with uncontrollable phrases spilling from our heart. How we love to sing our praises over and over to you. To the matchless God, high and exalted over all. At each and every sunrise, we will be thanking you. For your kindness and your love. As the sun sets and all through the night, we'll keep proclaiming, Lord, you are so faithful. Melodies of praise will fill the air as every musical instrument joined with every heart overflows with worship no wonder I'm so glad I can't keep it in Lord I'm shouting with glee over all you've done for all you've done for me what mighty miracles your power at work and your power at work just to name a few Depths of purpose, layers of meaning, saturate everything you do. It's so enjoyable to come before you, Lord, with uncontrollable praises filling from our hearts. More love. 
face with all of my hands and I will seek your face with all of my mind I will seek your face with all of my strength for you are my God you are my God relationship, more intimacy, more um, acquaintance, more of walking in, in depths with him. You know, sometimes people try to get real whatever. I'm not sure. They, they want to tear apart everything. But, you know, more, more God in your life. In other words, more of our consumed with him. Amen. More of, more experiencing more of his power. Amen. He is our, he is our strength. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. He's the glory and the lifter of our head. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, find somebody and tell them, I'm, I want to be, I want to have more of Jesus and less of me. Glory to God. Well, you can be seated. Good to see y'all today. And um, if y'all happen to walk around last week in here and Saw a pair of Ray-Ban black rim glasses and picked them up, thinking, oh, it's cool. They're mine. <laughs> I, I, I got to Greenville to work at my mother-in-law's, and I'm glad I brought my other pair. Um, opened up my case to get them out, and they're in there, there. Yeah. They're not in my coat pocket, bar check. Yeah, that, that was one of the first things I did was check that when I got home. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, we're glad to see y'all. Glad y'all here. Um, we are walking with Jesus, walking in the Word, walking in the Holy Ghost. Can you say amen? Praise God. Um, don't forget our Wednesday night. Jesse, Jesse did Wednesday night. We were, we were, we had to go to my mother-in-law's do a bunch of work on the house. And um, um, I think I'm moving. I was, I was, we left last night at, at 7. I had finally gotten the top of the deck back on. Didn't get to finish the deck, but I got the, the deck boards on back on. And um, I put carpet down last week. I put vinyl down last week. I cleaned. I, put, I put, tore the deck apart, rebuilt most of the deck, um, and uh, got up this morning and had a cramp that ran from, from here all the way down to my ankle. And I'm, I'm standing like this, going like this, trying to go, 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 go. Because <laughs> I couldn't bend over in any position to try to rub it out because it, it would go somewhere else. I was like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> I mean, I'm, like I'm having a Holy Ghost fit right here in that. <laughs> Glory to God. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Well, anyway, if God's good. Can you say amen? Um, it's time to give. If you're in the offering envelope, Brother Joe's in the aisle. If you're giving electronically online, go ahead and get that ready. Uh, don't forget the, um, our, the church building fund. And uh, we're still believing God for our place. 
Um, we we got to keep that out there, keep it going, keep pe getting people interested. Um, it just takes the right number of people to connect. Um, you know, we, we started out with, with 500, 120 would pay for it. Uh, we're down to 380 or something like that. You know, we're, we're, um, we're pushing in on a third uh, right now, which is it's great, but it's not enough. And he's El Shaddai, the God that's more than enough. Can you say amen? <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Father, in Jesus' name, we speak over the tithe and offering. We bless the people accordance with your word. And thank you, the people are blessed by the holy word of God, by the power of God. And um, we receive blessings on their lives now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Go ahead and give in the name of Jesus. Uh, while you're doing that, let's make a couple announcements. Um, Wednesday night before um, Thanksgiving, we, you know, that's our tradition. We don't do that service. People are getting ready. They got family coming in town. And I don't care what governors have to say. If I want to have 35 people, I'm having 35 people. I'm getting a 25-pound bird. Hallelujah. And um, watch and try to restrict how big of a bird you can buy. I'll just, I'll buy two. Hallelujah. Um, but then that Sunday, the Sunday after Thanksgiving, uh, we're going to do remote. We're not going to have, we're not going to meet here. Okay. Um, so you can get up and we'll do it. Um, how many would rather do it at, at earlier, like at 10 o'clock or you want to stay at 1230? Raise your hands, 10 o'clock. Raise your hands, 1230. Raise your hand, don't care. Raise your hand if you're not going to raise your hand. I'm trying to get everybody there. I got something to do. I ain't raising my hand. Yeah, y'all got cameras. You're going you're gonna to hold, hold me to it. All right, praise God. Then we'll, uh, we'll see if we're going at 10 o'clock on that Sunday morning. And, um, you know, just meet at home. You can get up, get dressed, whatever. Um, we'll, we'll, um, we're trying to figure out how to have Dick and Nathan. And we thought, that's going to be too coordinated. Well, they could do worship for two different locations together. I thought, you know, that would probably be cool if we could do it, but I'm not sure we want to try to pull that off with a technical. Um, uh, we could put Bob out there. All right. Y'all are dismissed. Go ahead, guys. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Go ahead and open your Bibles, if you will. Um, you can go ahead over to the, um, the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. We're talking and have been and with, with our fireside chat interruption last week. <clears throat> Anybody enjoy the fireside chat? Hallelujah. Um, we're talking about righteousness and we're, and, and we're talking about <clears throat> being in Christ. Being alive in Christ. <clears throat> we talked about the in him realities, you know. Um, and we, we didn't go in them in depth, but we did cover it. Melinda, can you pull down the, um, um, the, the lights? All right, hold, oh, right there. Is that good? Any lower is too much, huh? All right. Thank you, Melinda. That was, not, that was a compromise. Hallelujah. But I do want to be able to see. Okay? So, anyway. Um, we talk about righteousness. Now, how far can I come this out here, Jesse? So, right here, I can, I can stand right. Oh, I can see y'all better from in here. See, you guys are closer. I see your eyes out here. And when I, up there, I can't even see you. I, I, Well, I was trying to say, I want to see Janice. J Joe, your head's in the way. Move, move over a little bit, Joe. Or Jan Janice, move. Move back, Joe. There you go. All right, now. She's changing the metering. So, we, we, you know, we talked, we talk, kind of pointed you in the direction of, you know, who you are in Christ. You got to read some scriptures for yourself. All right. 
My wife gets kids, you know, sending me emails all the time. Now, can you help me with this problem on the test? No, I cannot help you with this problem on the test. And then, they, then when they, when they got homework, can you help with this one? Can you help with this one? Can, they want her to do all the homework. And you got homework. Study your Bible. So anyway, we've been talking about righteousness being good. You know, being the, in the righteousness of Christ, God and Christ Jesus. That it is a good thing. How many agree that's a good thing? Hallelujah. And um, we, we're thankful for the fact that God's Word teaches us uh, who we are in Christ and that Jesus came to redeem us and to bring us in there. And so we got to a few weeks ago talking about how do we live like who we are? How do we live like who we are? Okay? And so um, we, we said, first of all, you got to allow God's Word to sanctify your soul. Are y'all going to be offended if I take my coat off? Well, just be offended then. Captain, you can be offended. How do we actually live it? Because being the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and not living it is not beneficial. Amen? And so we sanctify your soul to the Word of God. Okay? Uh, you know, John 10, 10 says, Jesus says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. James uh, says, receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, which is able to save your soul. Now, we know from James' opening passage of his letter, he's talking to the church. He's talking to believers. So he cannot be talking about getting born again. Are you here? When he said, y'all, y'all hear that little ring is coming off the platform somewhere? Um, we, got, we got some feedback going on. It's, it's, is it the monitors or something? When the lights came on, that happened. Turn the lights up, Melinda. I think that, that when they come on. Okay. All right. All right. Our, James isn't talking about getting born again when he says save your souls. So, so, so your suke, your soul, not your pneuma, your soul. I was getting... Move back over. Now, see, I feel like we're back in the old days with the, with the wire on me. We said we felt like a dog on a leash. I've been loose and let him go. Hallelujah. There is a reason we are told in the Word of God to get our souls sanctified, to have our souls saved or renewed, you know, made sound. Because we interpret through our souls so much. And that, you know, how many know if you've got a bad filter, it doesn't, it doesn't do things right? You can electronically and computer program, we call it filters. They put filters on stuff, but if you put the wrong one on, it doesn't do it right. If your soul does not get made sound, it will misfilter or it will filter wrongly things coming in, interpret things wrongly coming in, which in turn will cause you not to think properly, act properly, or do properly. It's just a fact. If you will continue in your life to allow human experience or human situations to govern your thoughts or be the filter through which you interpret things, you'll misconstrue the Bible. Now, people who um, want to live in a homosexual there's LBGTQ, all of it, plus and minus, whatever. Z, we, binary, non-binary, all that stuff is filtered through the human logic of what love is. But the Word of God teaches something different. But if you if you say I'm a Christian, 
but don't renew your mind and sanctify your soul and you allow a human definition of love which means let me do whatever I want or you hate me bottom line Whatever I, whatever I want to do, if you don't let me do, if you don't say it's right and encourage it and embellish it, you hate me. What's the problem there? The Word of God teaches absolutely opposite. But the Word of God also teaches love. So if the Word of God teaches opposite, and what the world says is love, I mean, of what the world says is right and wrong, and they do it under the guise of love, then obviously somebody's interpretation of love is wrong. It's ours. The Word of God will say, so sanctify yourself. We need to understand what the love of God really is through the Word of God to sanctify our soul to the Word of God so that we have a proper understanding. So that when you said, you know, well, we just, everybody needs to be loved. Well, yeah, but they need to be loved the way God says it. Not the way the world says it. You're a hate monger. No, I'm not. Now, I've been, I've been blasted for not, um, you know, jumping in on the BLM wagon. Now, number one, black lives do matter. The organization is a Marxist antichrist organization. Hello. And I am not going to cow down to an organization that's also, the, the, the people who started it are known Marxist. And Marxism is anti-church to the nth degree. Like I just said, the opiate of the people. It's anti-Christ because the state is the church. It is God. It is your provider. It is your supplier. I will never cow down to that. Now, I got blasted because I said, I don't need, my job as a pastor is not to uh, support and, and, and it's this kind of organization, when the answer to me from the Word of God is changing the hearts of all men and women through the gospel, getting them saved, getting their minds renewed, getting them living like who they are in Christ, you won't have racism. But I was told that wasn't right. I'm supposed to do it some other way. I am not going to get up here and get to a bunch of racial get down, bow down, I'm going to repent for being white stuff. When that's not the answer. That's not going to do anything but make somebody feel better. Or in reality empower them over you. Which is what that is all about. Instead of changing the hearts of people. I had dinner this week with a high school friend. <clears throat> uh, he's, he's a, um, he's a, he's a, he's a, just, just for, just for because of the discussion. He's black. Okay? African American, whatever term you want to use, he's, he, he's black. He calls himself black. Okay? And I hadn't seen him in, since we graduated. From, I graduated from high school. He was two years younger than me. And uh, we played football together at Aiden Grifton. And uh, we, we connected on Facebook. He's an evangelist. I mean, he is. And I didn't find, I didn't know this with this week when we had dinner. Um, he, he was coming to Faith and Victory right as I was leaving. Uh, and that's where he got. Uh, filled with the Holy Ghost and got turned on to the Word of Faith and, and, and his Pentecostalism. He grew up Baptist. But he's a strong Pentecostal now. Studies Pentecostal history and stuff. And so we had a, we had a two hour dinner. They ran inside the restaurant. Because they were closing, locking the doors and all this stuff. <laughs> Hallelujah. But um, I moved to Aiden in 1969. And, um, and so he was, he's two years younger than me, but the restaurant we're in is called, uh, it's called Bums. And it's, a, it's, oh, oh. Did y'all see my pictures on Facebook this week? Those collards. Oh my God. I had them three times this week. The second time I went back, I said, I want double collards. I got quadrupled. I got double orders on both sides. I didn't know that. Like, 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 ooh, glory to I ate them all. <laughs> Went back Friday with Janie, got double college again. They didn't give me quadruple that night. Anyway, I don't know why. But, we you know, he, he, he's, he's sitting there, we're talking. He says, you know, um, we're talking about systematic racism and all this. He said, there's no such thing. Because, you know, that's, that's, that's new terminology. He said, I remember 
my grandmama and my mama walking me from, and, and he pointed to the part of town where he was from, and I, I know where he's talking about. We walk over and on the side of that building, it's an old building, there's a little hole in the wall. It's a drive through now, but it wasn't back then. When it first started, it was a coloreds only in, where they could go and get their food outside. And he said, I remember them walking me up here at six years old, getting the food out the side window. We couldn't come in. He said, today I come in and sit down with the owner and we have dinner together. You see? Changes take place by the power of God. I remember when I moved to Aiden in 1969, because this, this kind of comes up when you drive through your old town. I remember riding up there was we were getting ready to move over there, and downtown these, you know, had that little old old city inset for the doors and stuff. You know, remember those kind of weird? They were a little slanted, and then door, and then back out and slanted out. And each little shop was like that. And they had the city cafe. And I look over there, and one side it says colored only, and on the other door it says white only. And turned the corner, went to the, by the, the city barber shop. Same thing, colored only and white only. I had never seen that. I was 1969, so I was 11. I'd never seen that because we, you know, we had been in a bigger place. Greenville was bigger, but Aiden was, it's gone. And now, I mean, it, it, things have changed. But see, the gospel is stronger. That you know, we, we had the charismatic renewal. We had things happen, and you got people like Terry who are the, uh, uh, evangelists. They got they got a church they called the Anointed Ones Ministry. Them, them them ladies have it going over there, okay? And and God's changed that place over these years. But it's, it's not going to change be, because I repent for being white. Or we connect with a Marxist organization. What changes people is renewing their mind to the Word of God after they get born again. Now, if you take your experience, and let me face it, let's face it, folks. I, we had one person in church one time said he was a college student in Mississippi. They were riding down the road out in the country, and a bunch of, bunch of honkies rode by and blew the windows of the car out with a shotgun while they were in it, driving. There's been stuff that's happened that's evil. We don't, we don't, we don't d disregard that, or d not acknowledge that. The devil's evil. Amen. There's, there, there are, listen, there are racists out there right now. There are white racists, there are black racists, there are Asian racists, there's Puerto Rican racists, there's Jewish racists, there's racists. I, we can't have a JLM and a AALM and a WLM and a BLM and a um, L LLM. Latino lives matter. We need Jesus. And then the church needs to be preaching reconciliation through Jesus Christ, breaking down the barrier. Hello. And making of the twain one new man. Hello. But when we don't sanctify our work, when we let emotion and when we let uh, human reasonings dictate to us our narrative of the Word of God, we will miss it. And we will come up with stuff that sounds good to us. And we can get our little amen corner to amen us. I don't care about your amen corner if it's not biblical. You can gather up your crowd and bring them to church and have them amen everything you say if you want to. But if it's not Word of God, if it's not the soundness of the Word of God, it doesn't mean anything. You're just reinforcing a wrong narrative. And I don't care if you like it or not. Yeah, I got an echo chamber here. My, fr my friend that we had lunch dinner with, <clears throat> we were talking about, um, and he, he got so turned on. He, got, he, he didn't know who Lester Summerall was and all that back then, but he, find, he got a hold of them and Brother Hagen and, um, you know, <coughs> and all of our, and our church had back then, they would have, they'd have everybody come through. I mean, Lester Summerall came through, Dennis Burke, um, John Hagee. I mean, you name about everybody you can think of the charismatic move came through that church just about it, you know. Maybe not Copeland, then it got Creflo, but I mean, you know, a bunch of people came through that church. And uh, I remember sitting down with dinner with C.M. Ward. Have you ever heard of C.M. Ward? A after one of our services. Love Brother C.M. Ward. He was, a, he's a, he was a cat bird and a half. He got on TBN one night, and um, 
looked at Paul and they were just talking. He says, well, Brother Paul, the assemblies of God must be on the pill. He said, why is that, Brother Ward? Huh, they haven't given birth to anything in years. <laughs> you understand? He's one of the founders, one of the leaders of the AG. Well, Springfield got mad and called him in, sat him down. They, had, they were, they were, they were rake him. He said, Brother Ward, we understand you got on television and said that, said that somebody's God must be on the pill. He said, what, what do you got to say? He said, ah! it's amazing what a man will say under the anointing. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a made-up story. I sat right there and listened to him tell it. <laughs> but we were talking about our church fathers. They're all, they're gone. Brother Hagin's gone. Brother Summerall's gone. Brother Osborne's gone. Brother Ward is gone. Demon Shakarian is gone. I mean, you guys go down the list of those, those Pentecostal pioneers um, from the mid-1900s that we grew up under. They've gone to heaven. And uh, we got talking about we need fathers again. We need voices that have a steering, clarifying voice in the church. Everybody stop vying for being the most popular. And so we need voices of clarity. Voices that speak the counsel of the Word of God, whether it costs them or not. Hello. And you little, you little 20 year olds and you 30 year olds aren't those voices. You might, you might be hip and you might be all that, but you're not the voice of a father yet. And so, um, we kind of fireside chatting a little bit different. To, uh, so we were eating dinner, and as I'm sitting there eating dinner with him, I got to thinking about this, thinking about all the, the people who've laid hands on me in my life. Uh, Brother Summerall, Brother Hagen, Brother Copeland, uh, old Pentecostals who were um, children during early Pentecost. Used to go to the altar. They were old. When I was a little, little kid at the altars at the PH Church, I'm down there at the altar. There are they're laying hands on you. God use this man for you. Yes, yes, young man, you're six years, seven years old. They're, they're 60, 70 years old. They came out early, early Pentecost. And I think of all, and um, Martha Z prophesied of me one time. He said, there's a, there's a deposit in you. There's a deposit in you, wells of deposits in you that the Lord has placed there, that God will bring out in, in, the, in the right season, in the right time. <clears throat> and, um, and so we finished up dinner. We got we, we, we outside because they run us out. We were, stay, we were still there by another hour or two. And uh, he said, well, let's pray for me, uh, Pastor. He called, he called us Pastor. We're, like, we're high school buddies, you know. Pray for me, Pastor. So I said, well, you know, as we were, sit, as we were sitting there, the Lord started talking to me about deposits. And I, I laid my hands on him and started to pray. But I was out on the sidewalk. Lord, take all those things that you've placed with me that you want to draw out and deposit in him now for, make his, for his ministry, to use him for the kingdom, for the glory. And, um, you know, and, and God did. I know he did. And we got down, he said, you know, I was sitting there thinking, thinking the same thing while, you were, while we were eating. I knew that you were going to do that. He said, glory to God. And then he went back to that father's thing. He said, and you need to step up and be a father. I was like, Who's, who else is around here? I'm like, wow. And so I just said, you know, I'm like, when I got, and I got in the car, so I started driving down the road. It's 20 miles back to the hotel from where I was. Uh, well, 15, okay. But it was, it was raining. It was dark on Highway 11 bypass. No lights out there. And Jesus, we're just talking. It cost to stand to the, for the truth. It cost. Now, the cost isn't greater than the reward, but it cost. There's a price to pay for, for taking a unrelenting, hardcore stand on the truth versus being wishy-washy and, and, and wavering here and there because it makes people happy. Now, I said some things during the election that cost me. 
because I just don't believe that we can support Antichrist and evil and, and then we pat ourselves on the back about how spiritual we are. I just don't believe it. And then find ways to justify it. Give it what, 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 a red herring argument. We can't do it. You can't do it. We have to be soldiers of the truth. Jesus says in um, Luke's gospel, the sixth chapter and the 47th verse, Whosoever cometh to me and heareth these sayings and doeth them, I will show him who is like. He's like a man that which built his house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood came and the stream beat vehemently upon the house, it could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. He that heareth and doeth not. It's like a man that built a, without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. And the ruin of that house was great. This is why we must renew our mind. We must save our soul. We must sozo the suke. You got to dig deep. We have to dig past human emotion. We have to dig, dig past human narrative. We have to dig past human experience. Or we'll misconstrue and misinterpret the Word of God. Hello. I remember um, a story one time. Uh, there's, a, there's a group of ministers. And um, there, were, there were two. One was like a civil rights leader. And one was a former KKK. That's a, that's a good mix, isn't it? If they were still in the old place, but see, they had gotten born again and turned on the things of God, and God had set them free, and they could sit there together at the same table where before they would have been ready to kill each other. They're breaking bread together. Why? Because the change that the Word of God, the new birth, and the subsequent application of the Word of God and renewing the mind brings to an individual is transformative. It brings you to a different place. Are you here? It makes you a different person. Why? Wow. So, I'm not bowing my knee and, and, and repenting for being white. I'm a new creature. I bow my knee to Jesus Christ and Him only. Hello? Well, you got white privilege. I got Holy Ghost privilege. I'm blessed... I'm blessed because I follow God. I do his I tithe. I give. I, I'm walking with God. The favor of God's on me. Ain't got nothing to do with the color of my skin. And it'll work for anybody. Somebody said a number of years ago, they came back and they, they went to a foreign country. They came back and said, well, that, that prosperity message is an American message. No. It'll work anywhere. <coughs> now, now, albeit some things in America got out of place. They, they, they were missed. It wasn't prosperity, it was manipulation. Some of the stuff people were doing and the way they were living was pure manipulation of the people. Uh, well, take care of the man of God. You know, you got to give up, got to give to the man of God. You'll be blessed. Now, the Bible says, don't muzzle the oxen that treads out the corn. He's worthy of labor, uh, honor, especially uh, double honor. They labor in word and deed. But it does not say that if you, you only have to, you have to give it to that higher anointing if you want to be blessed. Now, that's a manipulation tactic. Hello. And shame on anybody that stood in the pulpit and did that. Oh, yeah, they're just as dumbfounded looking as when I didn't have, I had the lights in my face. Those expressions on your face. We have to dig deep. And get into the Word of God without all that other junk. And let me say this. You're going to have to dig and dig and dig and stay with it and keep working it until you can rightly divide the Word of truth without all that other junk filtering it. Or it's going to cost you. <clears throat> Hello? I've seen the anger of people I mean, the people are just angry. That's, well, you can't be spending time with Jesus and stay that angry. 
There ain't no way. Where's the sermons in our churches where people are, are talking about, you know, this needs to be done, that needs to be done, this, this group needs to do this for this group. Where's the sermon? Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Hello? Where are the sermons? Father, lay not this sin to their charge. Come on now. Where are those sermons? We're not hearing that. Why? It doesn't fit a narrative. Where'd the narrative come from? The soul. There was, not a re there was not a renewing of the mind. There was not getting past all that stuff. When you fall in love with Jesus and you're born, how many remember what it was like when you first got saved? Yeah, woo! You loved everything. You didn't care. I'm born again. I got God. What happened? Over time, you allowed emotional things to begin to take supremacy again. Or somebody preach stuff. I'll say this. I said this last week. He that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Just because somebody's famous and got a big pulpit ministry or a big following does not mean they're speaking by the Spirit. Y'all out there, y'all go home. The voice of, I, I remember, some of y'all remember, remember back. Stuff started going on in the charismatic circle, word of faith circles particularly, word of faith circles particularly. And it would start going on and start getting out of hand and start getting weird. And all of a sudden, Brother Hagen would come out and start saying stuff. And it was corrective. And it, everything would kind of get pulled back in. Had that thing called warring tongues. All these young whippersnappers. The, that, that, there were two things that went hand in hand. Warring tongues and the Joshua generation. That Joshua generation was taken over. Old guys getting kicked out. Well, at that time, Brother Hagin was about 65. He had just about reached the Joshua age. You're some 20-something that wrote a book think you're some hot shot. Hello. And everybody, everybody thought you were some cool and so this and so that and come find out later you're a homosexual. Boy, it got quiet in here. But warring tongues. Getting in church and for three hours screaming at the devil in tongues. And everything was starting to go everywhere. Everybody's starting to get a hold of everybody. They're starting to have meetings where they all get together. And I mean, they're hoarse the next day. Well, well, if you were really in the spirit, you shouldn't have been hoarse. I mean, if, if, if this God's got you warring like this, now just because you're hoarse don't mean you're of the devil. I'm just saying, you know, your, your point is you're, you're going to scream at the devil for three hours in other tongues. Really? Now, I don't have any scriptural basis for that. Now, do you believe that there's ever been a time when people are in the Spirit and they're, in, and they're speaking in tongues and they're dealing with things spiritually? Yeah, but I cannot teach that and bring it out here and, and have you go out there and start practicing that. You can't teach experience as doctrine. Thank you for your enthusiasm. The things are the, there, there, are th there are things we experience sometimes that you can't go teach as a practice. It was in that moment, guided by the Spirit. That's it. But we'll, we, 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 get, we stumble on something. Oh, yeah. And we're going to go start a new series on it and go to all the churches to teach you about how to war against the devil in tongues. Cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. Because charismatic, word of faith people were the most gullible for giving big offerings because something excited them. He got excited. They started throwing the money at it without ever checking it out. We felt, whoa, we got the tingle. Well, maybe we just got cold. 
It could have been a devil ran by you. Well, anyway, y'all, y'all, y'all are thrilling. Who keeps putting faith in the church claps out there? And not you, okay. When we get our mind right, when our minds are, we dig deep, and we get, get a, I, I didn't give you the point for that was, it, it does what? It establishes a sure foundation by which we can operate. You ever been on something shaky? Now, we had somebody in church one time had a, had a church sound business, and um, he would hire me to go out on the jobs and, and help he, do small stuff every once in a while. You know, he, I got this, Pastor, I got this, this church. We got to hang speakers up there. And um, uh, you, want, you want to make some money on the side? Then, yeah, I'll go do it. Well, I did stuff I shouldn't have done. Because, see, when you get scoffling over so high, you're supposed to have outriggers on it. Because if you don't, when you get up on that third or fourth tier, it starts doing like this. And you're up there with 300 pound speaker array, tying it off, and, 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 and your foundation is going, mm-hmm. and you're saying, Jesus. I had another guy in church had a, kind of a similar business one time. He said he had a stack like that and then put a ladder on it. He's up there on top of all that with a ladder on top of all that. I thought I was dumb. Now that definitely came under the foolishness, foolishness category. But I've noticed that when you're doing things and you don't have a sure foundation, it's harder to do them. We need in the church to have a sure foundation. We need to, listen, it's not enough to have known the Word of God. You must know the Word of God. What you know can diminish. I don't believe that. Once you got it, you got it. Okay. Glad you were so confident in your statement. Do you want to take it back before I get to the Bible? as I find it. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Hebrews 2, 1. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord, was confirmed upon us upon them that heard him. Now, it can what? What can happen to the word that we receive? It can slip. How does it slip? We let other voices enter in. We let other narratives enter in. And they begin to vie for our soul. And as they integrate into our thinking, even though we're, we're men of God, we're people of God, we know the Bible. If you're letting that junk in and you're not keeping it out through the Word of God, knowing the Word of God, not having known the Word of God, you'll get the, what is the worst place is self-deception. Because you'll think your own. Listen, folks, I've heard people talking. There are some people out there that the anger in them is so disgusting, and yet they, they, they do it, they, they hoop, they holler, they do it like, a, like they're preaching. But the spirit behind it is nauseating. The spirit behind it, you go, oh my God, they've given themselves over. That, that narrative is of the, is anti. Listen, folks, the spirit of Antichrist is in the earth. So I'm, as, as your pastor, as those watching on the internet, as, as, as a church father, I'm, I'm, let me know this, next year is my 40th year in ministry. 
40 years next year. I was ordained in, in May of 1981. 40 years ago, 40 years ago this coming next year. 30 plus of it's been here at Faith and Victory Church. Yep, sure enough. I think in 40 years I learned something. I hope I think I did. And quite honestly, I don't like that look of me leaning on the podium from the side. I'm going to get behind it. I just looked at it on Facebook. I was like, oh, no, I don't like the way that looks. There are days that I wondered, why am I still doing this? But I, 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 understand, I think I'm beginning to understand. There's voices that have to be stable. One thing you can go back, I bet you if you go back every year and pull sermons we preach every year, there's going to be consistency. I know, I'm not going to believe it. I know there is. Because we haven't changed what we preach. Hello. Now maybe more mature, maybe more, hopefully more mature, more depth to it, but still the same thing. There's been consistent, in 40 years I've been consistent with the same messages. Amen. We, as the body of Christ, must return to the simplicity of what does the Word say? Not just your name. Listen, you can't take a narrative and run to the Bible and try to prove your point. Why? Because that's still being driven by that unrenewed part, that, that soulish part, that emotional part of your thinking. Am I good here? Boy, I've got to get into our own building and have our three cameras up. I can go anywhere I want to go. And we zzz, I mean, Janice, you love Pastor Ed, don't you? Go back there and slap cap. I'm surprised she hadn't already gone over there and done it. The importance of getting back to where the Word of God is the preeminent source of underlying thought and not a narrative that we go to the Word of God to prove out has to return. We have to return to the Word of God being how we are governed. It governs our thinking. It governs our doing. Hello? Hello? I've been amazed at how many people, Christians, forget about the world. The world's going to be the world. Now, I don't mean forget about them. We want to preach them and get them saved. But their opinions don't mean nothing. But I've been amazed at the church going and looking for ways to justify their actions in things that is so obviously wrong. But going and trying to find Scripture and arguments that would support their position because they know the other position is wrong. So they're finding ways to justify it. It's just like the, you know, um, the, the, that hyper grace stuff. People were going out, well, it don't matter if I go out and drink. It don't matter if I, it don't matter if I go out and, and commit a fornication. If I drink and do all this, I'm pre-forgiven. I almost got whiplash on my neck when I heard that the first time. But I was too healed to get it. That's the only reason I didn't get it, because I'm the healed of the Lord. But I mean, I popped around. What? So you're just thinking, you know it's wrong, but how are you going to get around it? I'm pre-forgiven. See, you come up, well, where'd that come from? It didn't come from Jesus. Come out from among him, be separate, and touch not the unclean thing, the Bible says. It didn't say you're pre-forgiven, go ahead and live it up. 
This is what I'm talking about. We've got things coming into the church, we call it politically, uh, church doctrine wise, all kinds of ways that people are letting human narratives determine how we interpret the Word of God. Abortion's wrong. Yeah, but who says that's any more important than us, another innocent life? Who determines the innocent? I'll, de I'll define it, and I don't really care whether you like it or not. An unborn baby is defenseless, cannot do anything for itself, cannot fight back, could not have done anything wrong, and wasn't resisting. Now, in innocent adult life, it's wrong. There are, there are, there's remedies for that. Hello. The court systems need to deal with that if there's, if there's injustice. But that baby has no choice. That baby has no alternative. It can't get away. It can't argue for itself. And to go into the womb and cut the arms off and the legs off and the head off and suck out the pieces and then equate that and say, well, I'm against abortion, but, you know, what means this life is more important than somebody else's? That is a heinous practice. To pull the head out and shove a pair of scissors up in the back of the spine, of the base of the head, and take a, th a suction and suck its brains out, and then pull that out as an aborted fetus, and then equate that to some kind of injustice somewhere, I'm sorry. You can't equate them the same. Well, sin is sin. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, the seventh is an abomination. So they ain't equal. The ones that got turned over to a reprobate mind were homosexuals, not everybody else. Abortion is a scourge on this nation. The legalization of it is a scourge. And anybody goes, I'm, I'm against abortion, but I'm going to vote for people who do abortions. So there's something wrong with that. There is something wrong with that. I don't, care, I don't care what argument you lay on the table. We got people now who want to abort the babies right up until the moment they're born. Actually, they're floating the concept of after they're born if you decide you didn't want it. Or if it was a botched abortion, it's alive. See, laws right now say if it's a botched abortion, they're alive. You have to try to save it. But now we're going to come along and go, oh, no, we didn't, it's a girl. I wanted a boy. I, I, because I saw somebody put on Facebook, on Twitter or whatever recently, and it got, it got caught and sent nationwide. Um, going to the doctor today, have an, uh, an ultrasound to find out if it's a baby, if it's a girl or an abortion. Hashtag hate all men. And we're in the church arguing. We're arguing in the church about the ability to not agree with that, but still vote for it. There is not an argument. And you are wrong. Period. And don't even come out with some of your red herring, stupid arguments that don't, ma don't match up. You're wrong. And the spirit you're operating in is wrong. What about injustices? We need to change men's hearts. The gospel has to change men's hearts. But in the process, I'm not going to support people in any way, shape, or form. Who are going to do that to unborn children? And if you're mad at me, be mad at me. But I'm going to tell you something. What I'm saying is nothing like what the Lord's going to say. Oh, he's all love. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Well, that's not good. That doesn't go with our charismatic word of faith. I know, tough. It's still Bible. Thank you for your enthusiasm. It doesn't change the Bible just because we don't, it doesn't fit our charismatic word of faith narrative. 
that all, everything with God's hunk of dory. If you ever say anything to God, neg about, it's negative. It's not God. Let me tell you something, folks. God is going to judge people according to their works. I'm pretty forgiven. Yeah, you might still go to heaven, but you're going to, the Lord's not, listen, the Lord's going to be. This is why we got to get back to the Bible. This is why we got to get back to where the, we renew our mind to the word. We get full of Jesus. And then when the world starts bringing this antichrist garbage down here, well, is the Republican Party the only part? No. I mean, they were running a presidential candidate a few years ago. I wouldn't have voted for him um, if the devil was running against him. Because he supported abortion. You got a, you're a one-issue candidate. I'm a God-issue candidate. I don't support abortion. I don't support LBGTQ. One of our current candidates who's, we don't know who's won. It's still out there. It's going to be litigated. I don't know when that's going to take place wants children as young as eight years old to be determined, able to determine if they're a male or a boy or a girl. <coughs> Do you think God's supporting that? Yeah. Well, the other guy lies. He's a, is there a politician that doesn't? That don't justify it, but don't come up here and pick on one guy and say, I can't vote for him. He's a liar. Well, they just don't vote. Because they all are. Well, 95% of them anyway. Hello. Some of y'all are liars. So stop it. We have gotten here in the church. And listen, things are, things are wrapping up, folks. There are things going on in the world right now that if the church does not become the church and speak with authority on righteousness and what's right, and, 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 and I'm not talking about all the, the, everything on the social issue. Listen, I'm talking about moral. You know what's wrong with our young people? Our families. And I'm not just talking about one color. I'm talking about all our families. How many, how many families go to church now? How many families have we gotten born again? How many families, instead of being at church, they're home cutting grass on Sunday, and the kids are out cutting the grass, and then they're out to the golf course or to the pool or wherever they're going, and they're not coming to church? Now, the nuclear family is now racist, by the way. What is the nuclear family? A mom and a dad and a child. Not two women and a child and two men and a child. The mom and dad and the child. That's racist. It's God. Because you're just being right. No. God had a family before he had a church. The family was the nucleus of creation. A man should take, leave his father and mother, cleave unto his wife. They'll be fruitful and multiply. It is the God plan. Now to call that nuke racist, like it's some kind of badge of honor not to have mom and dad in the house, is racist. I mean, it's, it's right and wrong. If you see preaching things, you're racist. No. There's where the voices in the church need to be. Hello? Instead of encouraging bad behavior, speaking what the Word of God has to say. Our young people need Jesus. Just had one of our, uh, just found that last week, Monday. One of our kids that graduated in May is dead. You probably saw it in the news, news at the New Hope Church at High Point. They were outside having an outdoor service. And they rode by and shot and killed him and hit several other people. He was one of our graduates. I knew him well. Talked to him. You got to keep it straight, son. He, he, stuff. And I won't go into it because I don't bear in line. I don't, want, I don't want to disparage. But this, he, he, he lived and stuff and did stuff that was, we knew was gonna, it was going to get him every day if he didn't get it out, get rid of it. He got a graduation picture holding his little boy. One of our other students, they, they, they had a baby. 
dying. I'm telling, I'm telling you, this kid had a knockout smile. And when he wasn't, when he wasn't high, he had a great personality. You just loved the kid. Even when you knew he was doing stuff he shouldn't be doing, you just loved the kid. He really did. And they ride by, and, say, and they, pretty doggone sure it was a hit, just how things go. The outside shot, he, he's dead. One of our other kids was killed in April when they, he had dropped, he kind of dropped out during the, all the COVID stuff. Stabbed to death in the parking lot at the food line on Random and Road at 12 o'clock during the day. Had talked to him more than once. Listen, if you need to talk, I'm here. You know, you know I'm a pastor. You can come talk to me. We'll, we'll talk. He's dead. Two years ago, one of our students, we had, we had a couple run-ins, but we got straight. Like, son, you don't want to mess with me, so let's, let's just go past that. Okay? Now, I, I'll, I'll, I'll help take care of it, but you, you, don't, you don't want, you, you're, just, you're just not going to get up here and think you're going to get up my face and get up my grill and think you're, you're something else. We got past that and we got cool. And I sat down with him in, 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 a, in one of the small classrooms on a Friday. And it was one of the first few times I really had, had, had an opportunity to have a long conversation with him. And I said, what do you want to do with your life? He said, well, I want to, I want to, I want to uh, do construction. You know, my, my uncle does construction. I said, oh, that's great. I said, that's awesome. You know, it's good. You've got to have a dream. I said, look, why don't you work hard here in school? And then go to GTCC and get your contractor's license because that's the guy that makes the money. I said, yeah, you can work hard and stuff, but if you're in charge, you get to make all the money. I said, and all the experience you have, you can work your way up to where you're running the thing. And we're having this long conversation and his dream was to do this and, you know, get, you know, and, and uh, he had to have all these dreams he was talking about. But he dealt with drugs. You know, dealt with the gangbangers. That Saturday night, they're supposedly playing Russian roulette in the back bedroom and shot himself in the head. Back here. I don't believe it. Still don't believe it to this day. Too many fishy things about that circumstance. But we're, dealing with, we're dealing with a culture of kids who the church is playing games instead of reaching those families and telling them, Get your lives together. Live a life. Demonstrate. And, and those that don't have fathers, we're going we're gonna to be, be a father influence. Um, if, you know, but you've got to have that family to take these kids and protect them and treat, grow them up in the Lord. And get them off the doggone streets. Hello. I've, I, we buried three of our kids like that way. One of them last summer, the one who shot, got shot in the head was killed the summer before last, right before school got out. Last summer, right after school got out, about three weeks, one of our 15-year-olds hung himself. One of Janie's students. We've lost a student every year I've been at our school I'm at. At least one every year. And I've, take, I've taken some of them aside that are, that are wanting to you know, run the streets and do th certain things. And I put my arm around and say, look, because they like me. I, I, I get along with these kids. They like me. I know that's, that's hard to believe. The white guy at the school, all the kids of color like. The Muslims like me. And they all know I'm a pastor. Yeah, they all like me. They come back and give me high fives and fist bumps and all this stuff. And got one of our kids and loved the kid. Hung around with the guy who was just shot. And um, I put my arm around him. And um, I, I know one of our kids was killed. Um, and um, but, but, this, but he knew this one that got shot in the head. And um, I put my arm around him one day in the hallway because I don't want my, I said, listen, so-and-so, you know I care for you. Yes, sir, I do. I said, you got to keep it straight, son. I said, I love so-and-so. Worked with him, tried to help him. I don't want you to end up like him. 
Hello? I've had a stand in the hall. Another guy talking to him about the same, same kind of thing. You, you got to stop gangbanging, man. You got to stop this mess. Isn't that overstepping your boundaries? I'm trying to save a life. And have them stand with tears coming down their cheeks. You're right, Mr. Taylor. You're right. I said, you know I love you. I care what happens to you. You're right. One of the, one, one of the ones I talked to like that came back out of school this summer. I was, I was not there. I'd already gone. I'd gone home that day. I was at school. I wasn't working. Came in. Well, one of the assistant principals he can't stand. I mean, he just does not like this assistant principal. But he had to ask him where I was. He said, well, he's not here today. Well, tell him he came by the school to see me. He's, he's graduated. He's not there anymore. He wanted to come see me. We've got to reach our families so we reach our kids so we can reach that generation. That's what's going to fix all this mess. The anger in the music and the anger being perpetrated in the pulpits is not going to fix anything. I'm telling you, that kid was bawling in the hallway. He said, you know so-and-so. I said, and we, you know we had our run-in, but we got it straight. And we talked. And I tried to help him. I said, I don't want to bury you. I don't want to see you where he is. I said, I'm tired of burying our kids. I am. But it makes me more, it's just as angry for our churches to play the games they play instead of putting the truth out there and forget these dumb narratives. And it's time to say, listen, we got to fix the family and we fix the family by mom and my dad. And if you're a single household, by that parent coming to Jesus and trusting him for everything else. And to put godly men of influence in their lives or godly women of influence as a mom in their lives so that we can raise these, these children and break this thing. I thought I, was, I thought I was about to lose it, but I, 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 I hold it together. I love these kids. Hello? And I'm not supposed to because, you know, I have implicit bias because I'm white. That's where we go training, and I'm told I, you, you're implicitly biased because you're white. <laughs> and we have to sit in training and be taught this. That you've got white privilege. Oh, just take that stuff and go sell it to the devil because that's where it came from. I love these kids. I want to help them. Had one. <laughs> he, he, he's graduated, but uh, last, yeah, last year, year before, he was getting ready to take a test. And I was, I, I, I'm a TA, so I helped with the classroom. I stepped over there to see if the class was okay because my office was right next to it. And uh, he said, Mr. Taylor, Mr. Taylor, yeah, yeah, what's up? Pray for me. I got to take this test. I said, I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go pray for you. He said, no. Took his hat off. He wants to put heaven on anyway. And uh, put his head down. He said, put your hand up here and pray for me right now. And I kind of glanced over at the teacher. She said, well, he asked. Okay. <laughs> yeah. They find out I'm a pastor. They, they all know I'm a pastor. Everybody, the school knows I'm a pastor. Until they come in, you know, the freshmen come in, then they find out later, he's a pastor. <coughs> we love our kids. We love our, we love people. Hello. I don't go, well, they were, they were gang banging and they were doing drugs. They, they deserve what they got. No. I knew it was going to come if they didn't get fixed. And you reach out to them to try to stop it. And then when it does, you knew it was going to happen, but you didn't want it to happen. You wanted to get, you wanted to get that thing fixed. So I've told kids, listen, do what you, you've got to get out of the hood, man. You, there, there are ways to get out. You've got to get out. Because, you know, you know, once you're in, they, they, don't, they don't want to let you go. Especially when you're way up. We got kids who are way up. We have to, we, they, they get mad because we won't, they can't wear colors and stuff at school. We can't let them wear colors. We'll be having it out in the halls. We did one year. That's where I got the nickname, the Enforcer. 
We go down the hall, there's about 20 kids out there having it out in the hall. I mean, everywhere. It's mainly them everywhere. And one kid's got a, um, uh, a teacher's got him from behind. He's about to knock him over. And I came over and got him in a, in a, in a, in a hold on his arm and put some pressure on him. You're hurting my blanket. Well, it was, it was an effing arm. I said, you calm down. I'll let go. And he kept getting worse, and we just kept bending him over. And finally got to a point where the, the SR showed up, and he's in that position. Oh, you're out of control. Click. Had his arm right in the right position. All he did was click it. And started calling me the enforcer. Right out in the hallways, gang. Yeah. Well, you can't do anything about it. Yes, we can. We can stop the stupid stuff. And our churches have to be the first line of defense. Our churches have to speak to our families. Stop this nonsense. Stop being angry over what happened in the past. Nothing can be done about history. History is history. We can learn from it. We can make adjustments going forward, but you can't undo it. You can tear down all the statues you want to tear down, and you can tear and do it. Do everything more you want to do it too, which is what the communists always did when they took over a country. Or you can learn from it. You can let it be a reminder of where, we, where we've come from and where we don't need to go back to. Hello. Now, I know this isn't pleasant to hear all this stuff, but truth, the truth is the church in America is playing too many games. And it's because we're not letting the Word of God sanctify our souls. We're not digging deep. We're not getting past emotion. We're not getting past human narratives. And we're not getting to the heart of Jesus. When we do, we'll see a change again. Anybody get filled with the Holy Ghost during the charismatic renewal? Bill, Penny. I grew up. Well, I grew up in. You know, I grew up in. Um, I grew up Pentecostal. And the charismatic renewal was going on, but it, I, I got filled with the Holy Ghost in my Pentecostal church. Hello, and. Um, but one thing we noticed about Pente about charismatic churches that we didn't see anywhere else. Anybody remember your charismatic Word of Faith churches, particularly the seventies and eighties and stuff? What were they? They're multicultural. And didn't nobody come in saying, you know, well, this, you know, uh, your family was slave owners, and then, you, well, your family were slaves. None of that was going on. Why? We were so in love with Jesus. I said, we were so in love with Jesus and so in love with the things of God, we didn't care where you came from. We were just concerned about where we're heading. That's what it was all about, where we're heading, not where we've been. Because we all, wherever we came from, no matter where we came from, we came through the same door, the door of life. And now the mission is completely different. The past, you drop off the luggage, you drop off the baggage, you drop off all the junk, and you got a new future. You got a new purpose. You got a new destiny. And that, my friend, is the answer to the world's woes. It's getting people born again, getting people saved. Amen? Hallelujah. Anybody mad? All right, say, oh, say, but I'm glad, I'm glad. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Either some folks leave church, oh, say, but I'm mad, I'm mad. So expect more fatherly out of me. It's time we make changes to the world way past time. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him, there's none other. Jesus is the way. Amen. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him, there's none other. Jesus is the way. I don't know the rest of it, but I remember that part. 
I need words on the screen. Hallelujah. I love you, but I am determined more than ever to speak truth, no matter what anybody thinks about it, no matter what anybody goes out and says about me on Facebook. I really don't care anymore. Call me a hypocrite if you want to. I don't care. Hello. I've had, I've had stuff said about me by the best. Your little peon statement ain't going to bother me. Like Brother Hay used to say, I've been, I've been criticized by experts. These little squirts don't bother me none. And I'm right there with him. I've been criticized by experts. The little squirts don't bother me. Amen. And we pray that people whose eyes are open. That the, the truth comes. But you keep hanging around. The people you hang around, you're going to keep going down that road. You keep letting people speak into your life that are speaking from the wrong spirit. It'll affect you. Hello. Amen. Glory to God. We love you. I, of those that actually hung around and watched this to the end, we believe a bunch did. <coughs> Remember these words from 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. We love you. God bless you. See you next time here at Faith and Victory Church. God bless you.